it off. They crossed the river and climbed through the battered forest to be confronted at the top of a ridge by a chilling sight. As far as the eye could see, the trees lay like an annihilated regiment in serried rows, victims of some unimaginable slaughter. The taiga, the mighty Siberian taiga, had everywhere been thick and without any clearings or glades. But here we suddenly saw this place where the forest had been flattened for many kilometers. The young trees that had grown after the event were still not very tall, and therefore they were covered by the snow. It was this that made the first and strongest impression. We clearly saw the dimensions of the destruction. Of course, this made a shattering impression on us. Kulik, Krinov, Strukov and their helpers pressed on day after day through the debris of bare and fallen trees. They had no idea how far they would have to go to find the center of the devastation. They made camp, living as best they could with limited supplies, off the land and the water. Though even fishing had its hazards. Eventually, after fighting their way for more than 60 miles through the tangled mess of fallen trees and new growth, they reached 20 years after the event, the heart of the explosion. Kulik was to call the place the Tunguska South Swamp, the center of 1,000 square miles of devastation. Convinced a meteorite must be the cause, Kulik immediately began surveying the mosquito-ridden swamp. He thought that pieces of the object which had caused such immense damage might be found in peculiar pits in the swamp. His men drained the pits and excavated them without result. This tree stump at the bottom of one hole was proof that this at least couldn't be a crater caused by a meteor. Kulik persisted, but not a trace of a meteor was ever to be found. Then the weather deteriorated. Thing that detonated above the Siberian swamp in 1908. There no end of theories. One is that it was a rather small lump of antimatter, perhaps only a few pounds. Antimatter is material which has its atoms oppositely charged from those of our ordinary terrestrial matter. So if a pound of antimatter meets a pound of ordinary matter, the two annihilate each other, giving a colossal explosion. The other is that it was a very small black hole, if such things exist. And I say very small, perhaps too small to be seen, but yet still weighing millions and millions of tons. Again, if a thing like that plowed into the Earth, it would go right through our planet and cause a colossal explosion at the point where it entered and the point where it went out. The remarkable similarity between the Tunguska event and the after effects of the Hiroshima bomb has prompted many people to suggest that it was some kind of nuclear explosion. The heat flash was very similar. Trees at Tunguska were charred on the side towards the explosion, but on the shadow side they were comparatively unaffected. Exactly the sort of thing that happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Well, how could one have a nuclear explosion 40 years before we had invented the atom bomb? Well, perhaps a visitor from space had engine trouble and tried to make a forced landing on our Earth and didn't make it, but blew up five miles above the surface. There's been at least one book written on this subject and a lot of science fiction stories. And it is a plausible theory and certainly a very romantic one. The Tunguska explosion took place in the air. 
There exist only two possibilities for such an explosion. Either it came from an internal energy source in the body or from the natural energy caused by its movement. I believe it was a nuclear explosion from an artificially made object. The spaceship theory was born after the atomic bomb explosions of the 40s and 50s. The devastation caused by the bombs dropped on Japan was remarkably like that at Tunguska. The concrete buildings at the center of the Nagasaki blast still stood upright, as did the trees at the center of Tunguska. The charring of the trees, even signs of radiation at Tunguska, resembled atomic bomb after effects. Kulik was killed by the Nazis during the Battle of Moscow. And it was 1958 before the first post-war expedition was mounted. It was now possible to get by air to Vanavara. But the team still had to use precarious and inadequate boats and needed the help of the local reindeer herdsmen to carry their supplies. They also needed plenty of determination or they were able to get back to Kulik's original site. Although the new growth...